I'm a particle physicist. I work, as was said, on the Atlas experiment at CERN. So yes, I'm one of those useless doctors. <laughs> I want to tell you today uh, not only about my research on the LHD, but about a dream. A dream of making this society into a society dominated by reason and scientific method. To enable each and every citizen to rediscover their innate passion and their innate curiosity about the world around us. And in doing so, give them the power to understand and to help solve the problems of the 21st century. I'd like to start with one of my favorite comics. It's XKCD. I like it for three reasons, not for the conclusion. The first one is that it's a daughter asking her mother a question about science. At that age, kids haven't figured out that scientists are supposed to be men. The second is that the mother is clearly visible and has better things to do than to answer her annoying daughter's questions, yet she gives a very clear, concise physics response. No dumbing down, nothing. But what excites me most about this one is the fact that the daughter doesn't just accept what the mother says by just saying, okay, she must be right, she's my mother, but instead thinks about the limitations of what was just said to her. We're all born into this world with a natural curiosity, a thirst for understanding, an acceptance of reality that goes and go through because that's the way things are. My favorite book when I was a kid was called What's Inside. It had illustrations of explanations about what was inside many things. It had a passenger ship, it had a clock, it had a human body. And still, something like 25 years later, I remember what each of those pages looks like. In my case, my curiosity about the world has stuck. But in many cases, unfortunately, this curiosity disappears. It gets stifled. Is it because of parents and educators? Is it because of more pressing needs, such as feeding yourself, maybe looking cool in school, or maybe later on, the need to pay your mortgage? Whatever it is, I don't know. But it's the fact that this curiosity goes away that worries me. And it should worry you. Why should it worry you? Well, let's think about what the global problems are affecting us in this 21st century. Global warming, climate change, access to energy resources, sustainability, water, food, healthcare for all of the seven billion people on this planet. When you think about it, it's all about science. We need more people to understand science not just for the technical information and knowledge, but for the understanding of the process and the reasoning behind it. We need our CEOs, politicians, decision makers to be able to make informed decisions based on the science. Because without that, they might be swayed by other arguments, such as personal power, influence, or maybe even money. But it's also up to each and every one of us, because we do have the power to change things. We have our wallets. We have our votes, and we need to be able to understand these issues in order to force those other people to make the right decisions. Many people have already got great ideas about how to solve this, but we haven't seen any dramatic change. So what do we do in the Atlas experiment to perhaps pursue this goal? Well, first of all, there are many of us. So this is a picture, actually, of uh, some of my collaboration when we were busy celebrating the discovery of a new particle in July of 2012. Actually, this is only those of us at CERN. In fact, in total, there are 3,000 of us. There are 3,000 scientists working on this th collaboration. Think about it. We come from 174 different universities and laboratories from 38 countries across the globe. Out of all of us, about one-third are working towards either a PhD or a master's in particle physics. And using a rough calculation of estimating that about, it takes four years to complete a degree, and about half of them go on to do postdoctoral research later on, that means that each and every year, my experiment alone is putting out into the non-academic workforce over 100 highly skilled, highly qualified, enthusiastic young scientists. They go on to be teachers, IT consultants, stock market whizzes, some of them go into management consultancy, some of them even into politics. 
So basically, what, a lot of what we do on Atlas is to train our minds and the minds of young scientists in order to be able to think critically about the data or about the world around us. And hopefully, some of those bright young minds will then go and help apply those skills to solve the problems of this world. What we do on Atlas is essentially deal with vast amount of data. That doesn't sound very sexy, does it? But in doing so, we learn some crucial skills that are useful for everyday life. We learn how to do things like data mining, statistical analysis, and understanding of statistical significances. When someone says something is three sigma, what does that mean? Is it important or not? We learn how to deal with computer programs. Oops. We learn, apparently not PowerPoint. <laughs> but trust me, my C++ is much better than that. But basically what we try and teach everyone, and we keep teaching ourselves, is analytical thinking, is how to attract a problem, how to go about solving it. But one of the key things that we do, which is something very specific to our field and goes against the idea of the lone physicist in his basement 24 hours a day, and that's the fact that if you've got that many people, we have to convince that many people of our ideas. So we're used to standing in front of audiences, perhaps not as big as this one, and defending our ideas. So we're used to being the gladiators of our science, except instead of using swords well, most of the time, we use our minds. Well, the primary goal of particle physics is basic research. There are many spin-offs of what we do which have already affected your everyday lives. Probably the most visible one is sitting in most of your pockets at the moment, hopefully turned off. And so next time you open your smartphone and go onto the browser, next time you're looking at TED Talks online, Remember that this is only possible because of the brilliant idea of a scientist at CERN. The web was born from the idea and the need of a growing particle physics community to collaborate all over the globe. So without this geekish idea of somebody at CERN, you wouldn't have this quasi-infinite knowledge at your fingertips, nor would you be able to browse an infinite number of cat videos. I'd like to come back to the first cartoon and what I alluded to, and this is the issue of gender in science. I was fortunate in that I didn't have just one parent who was a scientist, but both my parents were scientists. Actually, they're both physicists. So for me, when I was growing up, it was quite normal that for my eighth birthday, I got a trip to Disneyland and an electronic set. It was quite normal that I would sit down for dinner with Russian and Japanese colleagues, and it was almost normal, or at least bearable most of the time, for me to be one of four girls in a class of 27 when I was in middle school. But I realized that my experience is far from that of most girls in this world. So I want to make sure that my goal of extending the scientific knowledge throughout the world makes sure it encompasses each and every one of us, and that includes women. I want to make sure that no woman is discriminated against because of her interest in science. Nobody will hold a social prejudice because she's the nerdy one doing maths homework and recess. Everybody should have access to science because science really is for everybody. Yet here are the facts. This graph is showing you the fraction of women in given age groups in the Atlas collaboration. Overall, there are 20% of us who are women. What we can see is that we start off, for those under 30, there are about 28% that are women, and this number steadily decreases till it gets to about 15% for those above 50. So what we can see is that clearly, while we're far from this mythical 50% that would reflect the gender equality of this world, we're making a huge progress. So we should keep going with all the initiatives we have to encourage more girls, more women into science. We should keep going. Actually, no, I think that argument's completely rubbish. What this is telling us is actually that we're losing a lot more women than we're losing men. So clearly, women are getting fewer opportunities to progress throughout their careers. Under 30, there are th almost 30% of them. And then by the time they get to 40, there's only 20. So where have all these women gone? Are they being given lack of opportunities because their boss bosses are men? Have they all left because an academic career isn't suitable for a woman? and especially a woman who wants children. How many of you bought either of those two arguments? 
The truth is, I've presented you one set of data, which was the data of Atlas people in 2012. In order to make either of those two conclusions, you need more data. So I think I've made my point about the need of being able to analyze critically the data that's presented around us. It's not because I'm standing here in front of you at TEDx that everything that I'm saying is true. You have to go back and analyze and make up your own mind using your own critical analysis of the information to see if you agree. Let's get back to particle physics. Basically, what we do in particle physics is smash stuff together at very high energy. We do that in order to study basically conditions similar to those that existed shortly after the Big Bang. We can look back in time using our vision, using all the space telescopes, looking back into space. But doing so, we can only go back to about 370,000 years after the Big Bang. But before that, we can't go any further because there weren't galaxies, there weren't atoms. We just had this bit, big hot soup of particles that interacted in, in strange ways. So in order to recreate conditions similar to those that existed at Big Bang, we need very, very high temperatures. And to get very high temperatures, that's essentially very high energy. And we do that with the LHC. In fact, at the LHC, we recreate conditions that are similar to those that existed about 10 to the minus 10 seconds after the Big Bang. So on this graph, it might look like a long way if you can read, but it's still a long way away from the idea of the Big Bang. So what I want to know is how we got from this big blob of energy called the Big Bang through to thinking human beings on this planet now, some 13.8 billion years later. But of course, we're only doing one small piece of the puzzle. Smashing stuff together isn't going to teach you the whole story. We need a lot of other branches of fundamental research to get an idea of the big picture. And trust me, smashing stuff together doesn't tell you anything about thinking human beings. So what do we know about the fundamental particles that existed around the time shortly after the Big Bang? Well. Here they are. Each one of those blocks is one of the known fundamental particles that we have. This is the standard model of particle physics as we know it today. We have the up and down quark, which make up the protons and the neutrons. And then we have the heavier friends. We have the leptons. You probably all know about the electron. And then, again, the heavier friends. And then you have the neutrinos. I won't say much about them, other than they call, have a cool name. And then we have the force carriers. Those are the things in blue. The one you probably know is the photon, and that's associated with the electromagnetic force. Each of those is associated to one of our fundamental forces. And then that little guy at the top, that sort of half blue thing, that's the Higgs boson. Actually, here today, I can, actually, I can make it solid blue. We're now fairly confident to be able to say we have found the Higgs boson. And we've been looking for this thing for about 40 years. <laughs> so this is basically it. How do we discover the Higgs boson? Well, here we go. Can you see a bump? Can you see a new particle? Come on, look closer. Can you see it now? How about now? Now we're accumulating more data. This is the data from last year. We're halfway through last year, and boom, there we are. There's our new particle. I know you're probably hoping to see something more dramatic or exciting than this little bump, but that's it. If you actually combine the information from that little bump with all the information from other little bumps you can see that are similar to it, you can calculate that the probability that this bump comes from only the other known particles is about 10 to the minus 12. Now, that's awfully small, so we're pretty sure that we've found something. So now what? Now we found the Higgs. Somebody's probably going to get a Nobel Prize for it. And now what? Do we rest and enjoy and bask in our glory of the standard model being beautifully complete? No. Far from it. Actually, at the end of 2014, the LHC will start up again at even higher energies. And who knows what we'll find in the next 10, 15 years of the lifetime of this experiment. And basically, this is exactly what keeps me up at night. <laughs> oh, 
beside the point that I had to change this plot last week. Basically, everything that I've been telling you about, this wonderful standard model of particle physics that explains all the data that we've seen so far in all colliders, well, that's the 5%. That's all the particles, every star, every galaxy. You add all the energy together, and you compare that to the total energy of the universe, and you find that it's only about 5% of it. We know that there are about five times more matter than what we know about that exists. So what is this dark matter? Well, we really don't know, but we're really looking for it. <laughs> and we really hope that the LHC is going to find a clue at, or find the particle. The dark energy, on the other hand, that's for our great-granddaughters to figure out. We also have a problem, which is, as far as I know, if we look around ourselves, we're all made of matter. Uh, yet the Big Bang produced equal amounts of matter and antimatter. So where has all the antimatter gone? Well, we don't know. Uh, then there are the mathematical reasons that we don't like the standard model, especially the Higgs, because the maths isn't very pretty and we like pretty maths. But those are the two arguments that really keep me up at night and that really excite my childhood curiosity to pursue the curiosity about the world around us. What it is, what is it that excites your curiosity? Thank you.